Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Russell Finlay. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, just weeks ago, the SNP released almost 500 prisoners early before they had served their sentences. And in 98 per cent of these cases, victims were not even told. The Government is now considering the early release of some of the most dangerous criminals in Scotland. And I'd like to ask, does John Swinney believe that this is the right thing to do? First Minister. President Officer, I understand the, the seriousness of the issues that Mr Finlay puts to me today. And we have to address the rising prison population in a sustainable and effective way. The Government took measures which were explained fully to Parliament and they only took place once we had parliamentary consent to the steps that we took. And my view fundamentally is that there is a, a difficulty about the rise in the prison population. The prison population this morning is sitting at 8,322. It's at a very high level and ministers are concerned for the, um, for the well-being of prison officer staff and for prisoners as a consequence of the level of congestion there is in our prisons. So we have to act and the Cabinet Secretary will give a statement to Parliament this afternoon on these issues. Russell Finlay. Thank you. In 2015, John Swinney's government ended automatic early release of prisoners serving sentences of more than four years. My party voted against it because we believe it should have gone further by applying to both short and long term prisoners. And so did the SNP, at least at one stage. Nicola Sturgeon even said, and I quote, our objective remains to end the policy of automatic early release completely. John Swinney might be even softer in crime than Nicola Sturgeon. Victims groups feel that killers, rapists, domestic abusers, drug dealers and child abusers could be freed early. So does the First Minister personally believe they should be let out with any, without any consideration of victims or public safety? First Minister. President Officer, if we follow the logic of what Mr Finlay said in his question to me and the Conservative position that he articulated from 2015, that would result in a much higher prison population than we have today, because it would result in prisoners serving longer than was the case, and we would have an even more congested and, I would say, fundamentally unsafe prison estate if that was to be the case. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to take the appropriate measures to ensure the sustainability of our prison system. Uh, the prison system and the reality that we're facing today, it's not a reality that we're alone in facing because this reality has been faced in other parts of the United Kingdom and significant action has been taken, was taken by Mr Finlay's uh, colleagues in government before the general election. It's been taken by the new Labour government after the general election to address the fact that there is significant pressure on prison population throughout the United Kingdom. Now, what we will take is we will take a responsible approach which will be subject to parliamentary scrutiny and we will always take into account the perspectives and the views of victims and address the concerns which they legitimately have about these difficult issues. Russell Finlay. The, the reason the prisons are in such a catastrophic state is entirely down to this SNP government. Now let's just take a look at the kind of criminals we could be talking about if a new form of SNP early release is announced today. Here are some examples of recent sentences imposed by Scottish courts. Seven years for raping a 10-year-old girl. Nine years for stabbing a man to death. Five years for sexually abusing four young boys. All of these criminals and many, many others like them could be let out early. People in the real world can't get their heads around criminals not serving the sentences that they are given. So would the First Minister ever find it acceptable to let those kind of criminals out early? First Minister. President Officer, the, uh, the, the issues that Mr Finlay raises are serious issues. And it's not for me to, it's not for me to question the sentencing policy that's independently decided by the judiciary. If I was to do that, Parliament would have... I, I would be breaching my constitutional role as First Minister, which has to respect... And it was part of the oath of office I took when I became First Minister, that I would respect the distinction 
between my responsibilities as the leader of an executive government and the independent role of the judiciary. If I trespass into that area, I am fundamentally compromising the independence of the judiciary. Now, that might be what Mr Finlay wants to do, but it's certainly not what this First Minister is going to do, who respects the rule of law and respects the oath of office that he took. Now, Mr Finlay has indicated or suggested that somehow we are experiencing um, a, a, a lack of action on justice. Our prisons are absolutely bursting at the yeah. seams. That suggests to me that suggests to me that and well there are, I, I'm been, it's been shouted things have been shouted at me, so let me just clarify. Scotland imprisons more prison, more offenders per head of population than most other European countries. Now we invest heavily already as a government in alternatives to custody to make sure we have a sustainable prison estate. But what we have got to ensure today for the prison officers who are running our prisons and for our prisoners to whom we have legal obligations as well, that they are living in a safe and stable environment and that will underpin the actions of the government. Yeah. Russell Finlay. Unbelievable. What a stunning lack of self-awareness. John Swinney talks about respecting judicial independence, but by releasing 500 prisoners early, he trashed judicial independence. Over the, past, over the past 17 years, the SNP have relentlessly weakened justice in Scotland. Criminals already get away with inflicting pain and misery on innocent people due to the SNP's failure to tackle crime. Victims and the law-abiding majority are paying the price. And for far too long, the SNP's justice system has sided with criminals and not victims. Yeah. Police issuing a slap in the wrist for serious crimes, the Crown Office diverting criminals from prosecution, and prisoners not serving sentences imposed by the independent judiciary. There's a stunning lack of common sense, and it's leaving people feeling that this parliament does not represent them. So why has this government stacked the entire justice system against crime victims? First Minister. That is patently untrue. Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Over, yeah. over the last decade, the average length of prison sentences has increased by 32%. 32%. That statistic alone yep. demonstrates that Russell Finlay is putting complete nonsense to me yeah. Yeah. at First yeah, Minister's absolutely. questions. Yeah. 98% of all those convicted of rape an attempted rape between 2019 and 2022 received a custodial sentence. That is another fact that refutes what Russell Finlay has put to me today. Now, we have an obligation to ensure that we run a stable and safe prison system. And at the level of the prison population just now, that is a challenge for ministers to fulfil our obligations. So ministers must act. The Justice Secretary will give full and transparent information to Parliament in her statement this afternoon, and the government will take forward the, the steps that have to be taken, but they will require the consent of Parliament to do so. Yeah. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When Parliament returns after the upcoming recess, it will be the start of winter, and every year we have a winter NHS crisis. But the Royal College of Emergency Medicine have said it is like the winter crisis, but every day and that the government continues to disregard the urgent need to keep patients moving through the system. I don't know why, presiding officer, they're heckling people struggling to get treatment uh, in the NHS. Mr. Sarwar, Mr. Sarwar, Mr. Sarwar, I would ask that members ensure that we can hear one another. Well, I think that behaviour tells you everything you need to know about the priorities of SNP members. But the Royal College of Emergency Medicine have said it is like the winter crisis but every day and that the government continues to disregard the urgent need to keep patients moving through the system. Three key factors exacerbate the crisis. The number of beds and resource lost to due to delayed discharge, patients not being treated due to long waits and a lack of capacity leaving A&Es overwhelmed. So we need meaningful action. Today, as I speak, there is an estimated 1,500 people stuck in hospital because of a lack of a care package. So can the First Minister guarantee that social care packages will be in place for all those people needlessly stuck in hospital so that they can get home for Christmas? First Minister. Officer, I 
acknowledge the challenges that Mr Sawa puts to me and uh, he will know from the previous exchanges we've had in, in, in other weeks that the issue of delayed discharge occupies a significant proportion of my time and the attention of the Health Secretary because delayed discharge is at too high a level and it's at too high a level for the start of winter. So I'm deeply concerned about that issue. We are trying to work individually with partnerships to reduce the level of delayed discharge in different parts of the country because there is significant variation around the country. Some parts of the country have very low levels of patients who are um, uh, in hospital and could be in other care settings or at home, and other parts of the country the levels are too high. So I assure Mr Sawa that there is deep and intense work going on with individual partnerships to reduce those levels to make sure that the objective that he puts to me, which is an objective I want to deliver upon, is one that can be achieved as we approach winter. Anna Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Officer. But despite what the First Minister says, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine have said that they haven't seen any useful measures, measures so far from this government. And long waits pile even more pressure on our NHS in winter too. So information obtained by FOI has revealed shockingly long waits for treatment, including an ongoing wait for urology treatment since 2017, a seven-year wait, an ongoing wait for general surgery from 2018, over six years wait, and an ongoing wait of over five years for ophthalmology, gynaecology and orthopaedics, among others. This is scandalous. Now, the SNP promised to clear waits of over two years by September 2022, but they have utterly failed. So people who go untreated often end up in emergency departments as their condition deteriorates, placing even more pressure on NHS services. So can the First Minister guarantee that every patient who has already waited over two years will be treated by Christmas? Minister. The, the National Health Service is working to reduce waiting times for individuals. And what we see from the latest information that's available to us about NHS inpatient and day case activity, for example, that that has increased in the most recent data available for quarter two and is now at the highest level since the start of the pandemic. Now, the problems that Mr Sawa puts to me, of course, are an accumulation of the impact of the delay to treatment because of the pandemic. So when we look at those figures on waiting times, those figures that I just put on the record were the 10th quarterly increase in a row and they are 9.9% higher than the same period last year. Now, that comes on top of the fact that we are seeing a 5.1% increase in the number of operations performed over the last 12 months, which addresses part of the issue that Mr Sawa puts to me, principally about orthopaedics and other treatment. So what we are seeing is an improvement in the capacity and the capability of the National Health Service in impacting on those weights that Mr Sawa puts to me, but obviously we have significant challenges to overcome as a consequence of the pandemic. But the government is focusing the resources with the investments that we are making, where we are making, we've allocated for this financial year a record amount of funding to the National Health Service at over £19.5 billion to make sure we put the resources in place to achieve the challenges that Mr Sawa puts to me. Yeah. Mr Sawa. So the Scottish Government promised to clear all weights of over two years by September 2022. And people right now are waiting four years, five years, six years, seven years for treatment. So that response will be cold comfort for people right now across the country. So, presenting officer, no commitment to guarantee care packages for the 1,500 people needlessly stuck in hospital to free up much needed beds and resources. No commitment to clearing long waits of over two years by Christmas, meaning patients suffering and adding pressures to A&Es, solutions that would unlock much needed capacity in our NHS. Now, the Health Secretary published his winter preparedness plan two weeks ago, but it has already been dismissed by key figures in our NHS. And rather than an actual plan for winter, they are supposedly moving to year-round surge planning, which, despite what the Health Secretary says, it proves that we have a crisis in our NHS all year round, a permanent crisis in our NHS. So will the First Minister listen to the doctors and the nurses on the front line and come back to Parliament with an actual plan to meet the scale of the NHS crisis this winter? First Minister. I, I, the Government is putting in place the planning to do exactly that. That is uh, the core duty of Government. 
We are also putting in place the resources at £19.5 billion, a record investment in the National Health Service, which of course is delivering for us um, increases in um, staffing levels to ensure that those uh, the, the capacity is there to deliver the treatment that is required within the National Health Service. And we, we have to recognise that the government can only allocate the resources that it has at its disposal. And we are allocating a record amount of funding. Now, as Mr Sawar knows, because we've rehearsed these points many times before, in the climate of austerity that we have wrestled with for the last 14 years from Mr. the Conservative Sarwar. government, places significant challenges on the resources that we have put in place. But we have excel exceeded the amount of money that was allocated through the Barnett formula to the health service. We have exceeded that yeah. because of the commitment of this government. Yeah. So if Mr Sarwar thinks it will help by following his approach on taxation, yeah. which would reduce public expenditure in Scotland yeah. by £1.5 billion, yeah. that will not help the National Health Service one little bit if we were to follow Mr Sarwar. And and as the United Kingdom Secretary of State for Health said when he was in opposition, that all roads do lead back to Westminster on funding. We wait to find out what the budget will tell us when Parliament comes back after the October recess. Let's see if the Labour Party breaks with austerity. Let's see if Labour are prepared to invest, because what Mr Sarwar has put to me today is a demand for more investment, and we're not getting that from the Labour government. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, the Cabinet will meet shortly after the October recess. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you. Uh, Stephen is a teenager waiting for a diagnosis for ADHD and a range of other complex conditions. His initial consultation with child and adolescent mental health was five years ago. He is still waiting for treatment and the family have no idea when he'll reach the front of what must now be the longest queue in the National Health Service. They fear he will face more of the most important years of his life, schooling, relationships, exams, without the care pathway or the medication he needs. This is a national crisis. Across Scotland, the number of ADHD referrals has skyrocketed. It's up a thousand percent in Glasgow among adults, but resources have simply not kept pace with demand. Today is World Mental Health Day, and we know ADHD can often present alongside other conditions, including anxiety and depression. So can I ask the First Minister, when we get to next year's World Mental Health Day, will Stephen and others like him still be waiting for care? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, first of all, um, I'm sorry that Stephen has waited as long as Mr Cole Hamilton has narrated to me today. And if he wishes to furnish me with the information about the case, I will, of course, uh, look into that, uh, that case and see what can be established. What I'd say to reassure Mr Cole Hamilton is that we've seen a 15 per cent increase in the number of people accessing CAMS services compared to the pre-pandemic levels. So in the financial year 23-24, there were 18,366 <laughs> patients uh, starting treatment in CAMS. Now, in 2022 and 23, we've seen the highest number uh, on record of people starting treatment with CAMS. Um, one in two children and young people referred to CAMS now start treatment within six weeks, which is a significant improvement on the pre-pandemic levels. Now, I know that is not comfort to address the particular circumstance that Mr Cole Hamilton puts to me, but I would assure him that the government has put resources into this area of activity. In 2022-23, the, the budget was increased from £98 million to £114.8 million, an increase of 17.2%. I hope that's an indication to Mr Cole Hamilton of the seriousness and the willing of the government to address these issues. And we will, of course, commit to doing more. And we'll consider the points that Mr Cole Hamilton puts to me when we settle on our budget position uh, for the next financial year, where I hope we can make improvements on the question that Mr Cole Hamilton puts to me. Question number four, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government response is regarding any potential impact on its Fair Work agenda 
and the nighttime economy in Scotland to the new UK legal framework that has come into force requiring employers to pass all tips, gratuities and service charges on to workers. First Minister. Presenting officer, we welcome the new legal framework which will ensure that tipping practices are fair, transparent and for the benefit of hospitality, leisure and service workers who do a great job every day serving our communities across Scotland. The legislation is a step in the right direction to improve pay and conditions for workers. The Scottish Government is committed to fair work as a key driver for achieving sustainable and inclusive economic growth and a well-being economy. Through our Fair Work First policy, we are using the Scottish Government's financial powers to drive fair work practice and enable Scotland to be a fair work nation by 2025. We will continue to work in partnership with business to ensure the measures enhance these important economic sectors. Claire Adamson. Thank the First Minister for his answer. I heartily warm this move as well. Uh, employers should never seek to profit from tips given to hardworking staff. I note that under the new legislation, workers will still need to pay tax on their tips. So does the First Minister share my indignation that HMRC appears to exempt politicians from paying tax on gifts from donors, despite requiring my constituents to pay tax on gratuities in other sectors? And does he agree that this re represents a clear inequity that the Labour government should amend? Minister. Hey, I think Claire Anderson makes a, a, a reasonable point. She, she obviously welcomed the legislative changes, but uh, key aspects of the income tax system continue to be reserved, such as the definition of taxable income. And this Parliament cannot affect change on matters such as tips and taxes on gifts. But she makes a very fair and reasonable point. And I'm sure uh, it will have been heard by um, those who take these decisions in the United Kingdom government and if they're all interested in fairness, uh, then the, the call that is made Mr. by Mr Adamson is one that should be acted upon. Uh, I'm not quite sure why Mr Sarwar is uh, so agitated about this. Maybe he's got something to be worried about. But, um, it's, um, uh, but I think the fair, the fair and substantial point made by my friend and colleague Claire Adamson is one that should be heeded. Paul O'Kane. Thank you, President Officer. I am interested in fairness, which is why I welcome today that the UK Government has published the Employment Rights Bill, which will bring about the biggest increase in workers' rights in a generation, ending fire and rehire, banning exploitative zero-hours contracts and introducing day one rights. All of that in 100 days of a Labour Government. But what about the Scottish Let's Government? Hear Mr. What about the Scottish Government's um, fair work agenda? I and colleagues have written to Government Ministers about uh, fair work in the nighttime economy, in social care, and we've been told that there is uh, no support forthcoming uh, to deliver on the promises that this government made on fair work. So I ask the First Minister, when is this government going to make good on their fair work promises? And in the spirit of new partnership, what work has the government done with the new Labour government to ensure the implementation of these workers' rights here in Scotland? First Minister. In terms of the cooperation between the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government, the Deputy First Minister has raised and discussed these issues with the Deputy Prime Minister, Angela Rayner. And of course, uh, I have an opportunity to meet the Prime Minister tomorrow when we both uh, meet uh, individually and as part of the Council of the Nations and Regions, to which I look forward tomorrow. Now, uh, obviously, uh, we welcome the Employment Rights Bill that's been published and we'll cooperate on its implementation. I am struck by the fact that the General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress has argued for the devolution of employment law to the Scottish mm -hmm. Parliament so that this Parliament can be insulated from the, uh, the, the legislation which has been used by the previous Conservative Government to undermine workers and labour rights in Scotland. And of course, I very much agree with the STUC on that particular point. Mr, Mr. O'Kane raised with me the fact that we're at the 100 days moment. Mm, and I think it's really important that for completeness, we talk about all the things that have happened yeah. in the 100 days. Yeah. Because in the 100 days, we've had the cut to winter fuel payments yeah. for pensioners, which nobody expected to come from a Labour government yeah. that was prepared to protect the rich and punish the poor. What on earth has the Labour Party been up to in its first 100 days in office? Question number five, Tess White. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is providing to NHS boards in order to reduce waiting times for breast reconstruction surgery. First Minister. 
President officer, I'm acutely aware that there are patients who have waited too long for reconstructive breast surgery, and I sincerely apologise to them for that. Reconstructive surgeries are generally highly specialised and can only be performed in certain specialist centres across Scotland, which at the current time are concentrating efforts on treating patients with trauma or active cancers. Regrettably, this means some patients are waiting longer for delayed reconstruction. As part of this year's £30 million additional investment to address backlogs, we have allocated funding to several health boards to treat patients awaiting risk-reducing mastectomy and immediate reconstruction. Building on this work, officials are now engaging with health boards to develop and progress the plan for patients with delayed reconstruction. Tess White. The Press and Journal reported that Denise Rothney was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2020. But due to the pandemic, she was told by NHS Grampian that she could have a mastectomy straight away, but not have a reconstruction at the same time because of limited surgical capacity. But three years on, First Minister, Denise is still waiting for her reconstruction. She's languishing at the bottom of a waiting list because, shockingly, the resources still aren't available to help her. And First Minister, you have apologised today, and I'm sure Denise will be grateful for that. But when will Denise and other women in this terrible position receive this vital operation? Always through the chair. First Minister. <clears throat> Presiding officer, I, I, I am sorry for the circumstances that Tess White puts to me, and, but, but the explanation I've given is the explanation of the challenges that we face, that essentially clinical priority is driving the attention to addressing those patients who are facing trauma and active cancers. And we are, as I explained in my answers to Mr Sarwa, trying to make progress on the backlog of cases that emerged during the pandemic, which, of course, is the context of the case that uh, Tess White puts to me. Now, I, I can't stand here and offer an instant solution, and I'm sorry about that. But what I will give Tess White the commitment is that the Health Secretary will engage constructively and actively with health boards to try to make more progress on the issue that Tess White puts to me on behalf of her constituent. And, uh, but I hope that Tess White and colleagues can understand that there is clinical priority being attached to try to save lives in the circumstances that we face. And progress has been made in that respect on cancer waiting times. But uh, I know that will be cold comfort to the constituent that Tess White fairly and, uh, puts to me this afternoon. Carol Malcolm. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Given the story we have heard today, and given we have had no published data on breast reconstruction waiting times following a mastectomy since 2020, can the First Minister commit today to ensuring publication of good quality data on these waits as soon as possible in order that we can properly see the trends in this area? First Minister. I think there are, there are issues about the, uh, the, the well, issues have been looked at about the quality of the data that we could publish. So if I could say to Carol Mocken today, I'll take that issue away and determine what information can be published, because I, I, I think Carol Mocken will uh, understand that I am explaining the problem. I haven't got a solution to it today um, because of the, the clinical priority that's been attached to treating cancer. Um, but I, I am willing, I'm very happy for us to be open about the challenges that we face here, but we have to do that on the basis of good quality information, and I will do what I can to address the point that she puts to me. Question number six, Christine Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reported concerns that the UK Labour Administration has not affirmed the commitment which was signed in March 2021 by the UK and Scottish Governments under the Borderlands Growth Deal to allocate £5 million towards a feasibility study to extend the Borders Railway to Carlisle. First Minister. President, so we recognise that extending the Borders Railway to Carlisle is a regional priority, and the Borderlands deal includes a commitment of up to £5 million each from the United Kingdom and Scottish Governments to develop a shared understanding on the benefits and the challenges of extending the line. We recently advised Scottish Borders Council that we are content with their proposal to recruit a project manager to lead this work. The release of our funding is, however, contingent on the United Kingdom Government approving its share of project costs as the growth deal is a partnership programme and the project will deliver a cross-border assessment. I would encourage United Kingdom Government Ministers to reaffirm their commitment as soon as possible. Christine Graham. 
Uh, I thank the First Minister for his answer, and I know the position apparently the incoming Labour government has not reaffirmed its 50 per cent share of funding. Uh, thankfully, Borders Council has agreed to progress with the appointment of a senior project manager to lead the delivery of the business case and feasibility work for the extension of the very, very successful Borders Railway beyond Tweedbank to Carlisle, using the 50 per cent funding commitment already received from the Scottish Government in June this year, and I note the caveat there, in advance of receiving full approval to proceed from the UK Government. But is it not of concern that Labour may be shortchanging Scotland in this very modest investment, which has such a positive impact on communities, particularly across Midlothian and the borders? Yeah. First Minister. So, officer, I'm aware of a number of cases, and the one that Christine Graham puts to me is in relation to the borders, but there are a number of others yeah. where the, there are questions um, and pauses being put into funding that we believed and uh, local partnerships believed had been agreed under the city and growth deals that were negotiated in the past. And these are being paused essentially for review during the spending review. And I understand from the information that has been made available to me that some of that will not be clarified in the budget at the end of October, but may have to wait for the spending review that comes in the spring, which obviously puts a significant delay into some of the projects that we would ideally wish to take forward and which communities are expecting. Now, I can assure Christine Graham that these issues are the subject of active discussion and dialogue with the United Kingdom Government, and we will continue to do that. Rachel Hamilton. Officer, I thank Christine Graham for bringing up this important issue. Passenger numbers, thankfully, um, have returned to pre-pandemic le levels on the Tweed Bank line, but people in Hoyk and Newcastleton feel left out by the issues with the connectivity to their areas. The Scottish, um, not the Scottish, but the Conservative government pioneered the Borderlands Growth Deal, which we all welcomed. Can I ask the First Minister when um, he plans to meet the Labour Minister, Lord Hendy, to discuss this very important issue and reiterate the benefits of the Borderlands Growth Deal and the extension to Carlisle. First Minister. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear Rachel Hamilton and the Conservatives' enthusiasm for the Borders Railway because I've been around here for so long that I remember that wasn't always the case when the <laughs> proposal was going through the Parliament. But we'll, but we'll, 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 we'll all move on in, uh, from that particular position. So I'm delighted the Conservatives value the Borders Railway. I think it's super. Uh, I think it's tremendous, the uh, level of passenger numbers that have been achieved. I know there's quite often quite a lot of congestion on the Borders Railway, and we're doing our best to try to address that. The Transport Secretary takes forward all of these issues um, with uh, her counterpart in the United Kingdom Government and was actively involved in discussions on these questions just last week in, in, uh, with the United Kingdom Government, and that will be maintained. Keith Brown. Uh, can I uh, th thank the First Minister for that response and say that the Borders Railway was, of course, the longest new railway built in the UK for over 100 years. But on the recent uh, cross-border travel, rail travel, well, the First Minister acknowledged the recent announcement this week that the Labour government is looking to extend HS2 into London, but has no plans to do what was originally intended and bring it into Scotland, even though it's cost hundreds of, or it's cost billions of pounds for a project that is meant to cost over £100 billion. The wastage is enormous, and yet there is no commitment to Scotland. Will the First Minister raise that with the UK government? Um, I... Well, I, I, I'm interested. First Minister, if I might, um, it is important that supplementary questions refer to the substantive question on the paper. Therefore, I am moving on to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Michelle Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today, the Financial Times reported that UK productivity is at its lowest level since 1850. It's also been reported by that UK government ministers have been asked to model cuts to their capital expenditure plans of up to 10 per cent. Does the First Minister share my concern about the impact this will have on both Scotland's economic prospects and its public finances? And will he continue to protect, pr press the UK Labour government to reassess this and plan for growth? not austerity. Yep. First Minister. Uh, Michelle Thompson puts a very fair point to me because we've had 14 years of the, exper of the austerity experiment and it's been a complete disaster. Yep. Our public services are under acute pressure. Productivity in the economy has not strengthened because we have not had the sustained investment that is required. Now, the Scottish Government's capital budget is facing a cut of about 9%. 
We are experiencing increases in costs because of multiple factors of construction cost inflation exceeding in some circumstances 35% of costs. These are the realities that re require investment in our economy. So I would appeal, in light of the question from Michelle Thompson, for the United Kingdom Government to use the budget on the 30th of October to end austerity and to start investing in the economy. That's what we need to fuel growth. Austerity has failed and Labour will fail Scotland if they don't end austerity. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Parents and pupils across Perth and Kinross are deeply concerned at the threat from Unison to strike for two weeks from the 21st of October, closing schools at the end of the local autumn holiday for a further fortnight. This action has been deliberately targeted at the First Minister's constituency and will impact on young people, many of whom already have had their schooling disrupted by COVID. Now, Unison claim they simply want the same pay rises that other public sector workers have already been awarded, but school pupils are caught in the crossfire. So what is the Scottish Government doing to try and avoid this damaging action from proceeding? First Minister. Presenter, sir, Mr Fraser will not be surprised to know that I take this issue deadly seriously as a parent of a school pupil who stands to be affected by this in Perth and Kinross, and as well as the representative of 64,000 people in my constituency whose um, families stand to be affected by this. And let me be absolutely clear with Parliament, I think there is absolutely no justification for, the constituents or for my constituents to be singled out and to be targeted just because I am the First Minister of Scotland. Yeah. A pay deal has been offered by local government. The government isn't even the employer here. A pay deal has been offered by the employers, which has been accepted by two out of the three trade unions. Yep. The two requests that were made for an offer to be made that was in excess of the offer made to the, or comparable to the offer made to local government workers in England and Wales, was fulfilled by the uh, local government offer. And the second test was that uh, there had to be progress towards £15 an hour and the protection of low-paid uh, workers, and that was fulfilled by the response of local authorities. So, for that to be accepted by two unions and rejected by a third, and then for my constituents to be singled out for treatment just because their MSP happens to be the First Minister, I think is absolutely unacceptable. So, I do hope that there can be some dialogue with the local authority employers to bring this to a conclusion, because the government has put additional money into <coughs> the financing of this offer. The finance secretary has had to come to this parliament to make 500 million pounds of spending cuts to make the investment, and there is no more government money available. Members of parliament know the limitations of the public finances. So I appeal for this issue to be resolved speedily by dialogue between Unison and the local authority employers where the proper dialogue should be undertaken and for my constituents' education not to be disrupted any further just because their MSP happens to be the First Minister. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. On Tuesday, Calmac announced that the return of Aaron's resident ferry, the MV Caledonian Isles, was to be delayed again. Since it was taken out of service for its annual overhaul in January, the timescale for the vessel's return has gone from early March to June to August to September to October to mid-November. This has greatly impacted Aaron's long-suffering people, businesses and visitors. With no obvious progress as yet on the redevelopment of Adrossan Harbour, how will the Scottish Government and its agencies ensure the ferry service to Aaron, the busiest in the network, is reliant, robust, resilient, and one that islanders and visitors can have confidence in. First Minister. Mr. Officer, I accept the points that Mr. Gibson makes on behalf of his constituents in Arran, and the position with the MV Caledonian Isles um, has been difficult. We thought the vessel would come back into service several weeks ago. Indeed, it came back from its uh, significant repairs in, uh, in Birkenhead, and we expected it to go back into service but the issue that Mr Gibson raises has caused a delay to that. Um, the Transport Secretary is in active dialogue with CalMac to ensure continuity of service, and there has been extensive and protracted and very difficult dialogue about Adrossan Harbour, which Mr Gibson, given his close attention on this issue, will know how difficult that has been. And there's been no lack of effort put into it. We've just not managed to get to an agreement. We have managed to sustain um, a two-vessel service on the 
Adrosin, on the Adrosin Troon Brodick um, uh, route over the course of this period, and uh, CalMac will endeavour to make sure that remains the case to service Mr Gibson's constituents. And the Transport Secretary will keep him updated on developments. Sandish Gohani. Thank you. A declaration of interest as a practising NHS GP. Uh, Drumchapel Health Centre in my region of Glasgow houses five GP practices and serves one of the most deprived areas of Scotland, with a rapidly increasing population with complex and multifaceted health issues, many of whom do not speak English. There is not enough room for core GP staff. The centre is unfit for purpose, which results in longer waits and widening inequalities. The staff I met are desperate for help, given the centre has been consistently overlooked for upgrade. So will the First Minister agree to accompany me on a visit to see how badly the people of John Chapel are being let down? First Minister. I, 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 I recognise the importance of access to GP services and the Health Secretary will be engaging on these questions in relation to the improvements that can be delivered to the capital estate. I'm sure the Health Secretary will be happy to engage with Dr Gohani on this question and to make sure that the issues that he puts to me can be factored into the Government's capital planning. Clear Baker. Um, thank you very much, President Officer. The first stage of hearings have now concluded into the public inquiry into the death of Sheku Bayo. The Sheku's family, who have shown grace and dignity over the last no, long nine years since Sheku died, are calling for the scope of the inquiry to be widened to include the Crown Office's decision not to prosecute. Lord Brackendale, the Chair of the Inquiry, has urged the Scottish Government to make a decision on this as soon as possible. But the family have already waited five weeks on what is a matter of urgency. Can I ask when a decision will be reached by the Scottish Government and if the First Minister recognises the pleas of the family to have closure? First Minister. Uh, I, I, I of course recognise the desire of the family to reach closure on this issue and the, the Government established the public inquiry to enable that to be the case. The Deputy First Minister is fulfilling her statutory duties which require her to consult extensively on any question of revising the terms of reference. Uh, that, uh, that work is underway and a decision will be taken as soon as possible. Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of recent reports that the Scottish Fire Service is in a deathly spiral of decline that might lead to loss of life. What is his response to these reports? And will he endeavour to outline how the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and the FBU can transform their service for that and make it fit for the future? First Minister. The position in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, uh, I think, <laughs> continues to be that the service delivers a high standard of commitment and service to keep people in Scotland safe. Uh, for this financial year, there was an overall increase in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service budget of £29.3 million, which is really a very substantial increase. And the budget is now £79 million higher than it was in 2017-18. So I don't actually agree with Maggie Chapman about her characterisation of the service, because I think the service has attracted investment and the service continues to perform well and to deliver safety and security to the population. Where Maggie Chapman, I will agree, is about the pressure on the public finances. And uh, that comes from the austerity agenda. And I hope the austerity agenda is going to come to an end because, as Maggie Chapman will know, we have to live within the resources that we have available to us. But I think we should have confidence from a service that has more firefighters per head of population in Scotland than in any other part of the United Kingdom and that one that is well supported by the government's financial commitments. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, despite plenty of warm words uh, from the new Labour government, much like their Tory predecessors, uh, they have snubbed Scotland once again and declined to invest in the Acorn Carbon yes. Capture Project. Yes. Does the First Minister share my concern about the continued failure of the UK Government to understand the energy sector in the North East? Uh, and will he call on Keir Starmer to rethink and invest in Scotland's just transition? 
First Minister. Uh, President Officer, the ACORN project that uh, Kevin Stewart puts to me and the Scottish cluster are vital for our, ju our, transition to, uh, our just transition to net zero. So this is a really significant strategic investment project for Scotland and, I would add, for the United Kingdom. So I am very surprised that there has not been more progress made uh, when there has been confirmation given to two projects south of the border, because this is so critical to our <coughs> prospects. Now, as Parliament knows, I feel fundamentally misled on this project yeah. by the previous United Kingdom Government, and I want to see urgent progress on this issue, and it's one of the issues that I'll be pursuing in my discussions with the Prime Minister when I see him tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. The next item of business is a member's business debate in the name of Paul O'Kane, and there will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and the public gallery to do so.